Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing on with AIG Canada's critical thinking checks. We're at check number four now, which is check the definitions. Yay, definition fights. I just can't wait. Why don't you go watch check three or something? That's more interesting than this one, guaranteed. And with that ringing self-endorsement, let's go. And check number four for thinking critically about any message is check the definitions. Yes, as annoying as definition fights are, it is important to get your key terms defined. If you're arguing with someone about, say, religion, and you make some point about, say, biblical inerrancy, but you never bothered to flesh out what the person you're arguing with means when they say Christian, you may undermine your own position by assuming that they believe the Bible to be inerrant when, in fact, they don't. See, sometimes words that sound the same can carry multiple meanings. For instance, I used to work at a greenhouse, where one day I remember a gentleman walked up to me and asked, do you have time? Now, he might have been asking whether I had time to answer a question, but I thought he might have been checking what time it was. I would have thought that the fact that you were working at a greenhouse would have provided enough of a clue to figure out that he meant the plant time. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, anytime I'm cooking with time, I do dad joke about not having enough time, having too much time, running out of time, throwing it and saying that time flies, and what have you. But you're setting this up in a way that's making the punchline way too easy to predict. So I said, yes, sir, it's quarter to three. So he started spelling T-H-Y-M-E, and I realized that he was looking for the plant called thyme. Yes, because you were in a greenhouse, the place to buy plants. Now, thyme and thyme are different words, even though they sound the same. But sometimes even the same word can have multiple me meanings which need clarification. This series is ostensibly for college kids. Why are we sitting here learning grade one English? Words carry different ideas in different contexts, or they mean different things to different people. Yeah, so if you say evolution to an evolutionary biologist, they will probably think something along the lines of the change in allele frequency in a population over successive generations. But if you say it to a creationist, they'll want to distinguish between micro and macro evolution, and they usually have a misunderstanding of what the terms micro and macro evolution even mean. And then based on this misunderstanding of what macro evolution is, they will have a claim of macro evolution being impossible. And some words like person, science, religion, and evolution are prime examples. I took entire classes about evolution, and when my textbooks gave ev examples of evolution we can see happening, it was always evolution in the sense of what we, from a biblical perspective, would view as variation within the original kinds of living things that God created. Okay, so since we are in the video talking about getting pedantic with your definitions in order to make sure everyone is on the same page, can you provide a definition of the word kind, please? If truly unrelated created kinds exist, that should be an easy exercise. And yet, I have never seen a single creationist successfully define kind without accidentally admitting to macroevolution. Like finches. In my biology classes, we talked about how mutations and natural selection can let finches with long beaks give rise to finches with short beaks. There's a lot more to it than just beak size. Body size, coloration, and song, for starters. We actually observed a speciation event with these finches in the wild. One individual from the island of Santa Cruz made its way to Daphne Major in 1981 and managed to successfully mate with one of the local chicks. One of his bird babies mated with another local chick, and aside from these two interbreedings, they have remained a reproductively isolated line. They have a distinct beak shape, they are sized differently from the locals, and they have a distinct song. This was a speciation event, specifically a homoploid hybrid speciation event where there isn't a chromosomal doubling. This type of speciation event is rare, but has been observed several times in plants, butterflies, flies, fish, mammals, and birds. Since macroevolution is simply evolution that happens above the species level, then by definition, these were macroevolutionary events. That's cool. But like you can learn more about through other Answers in Genesis resources, including some of the ones linked to this video. Just make sure you remember to use critical thinking check number three when you're doing so. Consider the source. 
Is Answers in Genesis a reliable source for scientific information? Well, let's just take a look at their website for a second. Okay, under the Answers menu, I clicked on Evolution, and this is right at the top of the page. Notice that they refer to people who accept evolution as evolutionists. This is not a label that people generally self-identify with, so it strikes me as an attempt to create an us-versus-them dichotomy where one doesn't necessarily exist. Then, when talking about evolution itself, they use derogatory language to throw shade on the part of evolution that they are most strongly opposed to. Given that the worldview of this source is decidedly anti-evolution right from the get-go, I'm going to go ahead and use these derogatory phrases as evidence that AIG clearly has ulterior motives for making their case like this. So AIG fails, AIG's critical thinking check number three. This is quite the contrast from the scientific sources that confirm evolution. They openly disclose where they get their financial support from, and any shenanigans about hiding their financial backers can result in a retraction of their work. Their work also has to be reviewed by other scientists working for other, often directly competing organizations before it can be published. And what's more, papers that have supported evolution or been supported by evolution have come from scientists of vastly different worldviews. So, applying AIG's critical thinking check number three to Answers in Genesis and to the reputable scientific journals, we find that AIG definitely has some worldview motivations that drive them towards certain conclusions over others, while the other accepts submissions from people regardless of their worldview as long as the submission meets their stringent scientific requirements. And yeah, sometimes bad papers do make it through, like that horrendous alien octopus paper. But this is where the beauty of the system comes in. You don't even have to wait for the next issue issue of the journal it was published in to find criticism of that paper, with a quick commentary on it that ends with the line, the main statement about viruses, microbes, and even animals which came to us from space cannot be taken seriously. So scientific journals pass AIG's critical thinking check, while AIG themselves do not. Even if you count their research journal, which states right in their submission guidelines that your paper has to come to approved conclusions before they will consider publication, being so explicit as to state that the editor-in-chief will reject papers that don't conform to AIG's statement of faith, a statement which includes beliefs that contradict the scientific consensus in several areas. In other words, you can't get your paper published by their research journal unless you agree with conclusions that they decided in advance were true. So not only does AIG fail critical thinking check number three, their supposed peer-reviewed research journal fails it as well. All this to say that if you are learning things from AIG resources like she just suggested, you are learning things that don't even pass AIG's own critical thinking standards. Mutation and natural selection can't actually produce the types of changes required to evolve one kind of living creature into another. Yeah, I peeked at the links she provided. It's the usual creationist tripe about no new information being created without ever clearly defining what they mean by information or explaining what constitutes new information. It is often claimed by creationists that mutations cannot create information, only destroy it. Usually, there is a heavy implication that the information is based on genetics, with emphasis on new genetics. Okay, so insertion mutations should count as new information then, right? Because those happen. Is a point mutation, one where a base pair simply swaps to another base pair, an addition of information? And, of course, all of this ignores the fact that most types of mutations are reversible. If there is a point mutation in a sequence that was originally CGTTA, but then became CGTTG, did this count as new information or a loss of information? Let's say that the mutation completely broke a gene. Would it then be a loss of information? Okay, so in the next generation, there is another point mutation in the same place that brings it back to CGTTA. If the first mutation was a loss of information, then this has to be a gain of information. And of course, this also ignores things like gene duplication or horizontal gene transfer, which are more ways that your genetic code can get new information. So while my textbook is called Variation in Finchbeak's Evolution, it's not an example of evolution in the sense of change between kinds, like dinosaurs evolving into finches. Firstly, it can't be an example of evolution between kinds until you define kind. It's rather ironic that you bring up kinds in your video on checking the definition. Are you trying to pitch me softballs? But more than that, no, the beaks are not in and of themselves evidence that dinosaurs evolved into finches. Because dinosaurs didn't evolve into finches, dinosaurs evolved in different populations over time, and one group of theropods developed traits that we now associate with birds, and so we have the avian dinosaurs, which include finches. 
And when discussing natural selection, it is easier to conceptualize it with regards to fairly small changes over short periods of time, like the finches' beaks. So those are the examples that they use. These variations will add up when extrapolated out over long periods of time, but creationists love to point out that natural selection by itself only acts on traits that are already present, and so doesn't explain the origin of new traits. And you're right, the origin of new traits is not explained by natural selection. But natural selection does not exist in a vacuum. The new finches that we observed in a speciation event have traits that are not found in either of the parent species of the new hybrid species. We watched these new traits develop. Sure, you can complain that it's just a beak, or just size, or just a song, but the fact of the matter is that these are traits that are absent in the parent lineages, making them new traits for that lineage, by definition. Making that a good example of evolution, also by definition. But you know, textbooks will tell you these things are equal. I doubt that. In my experience, it has usually been a case of the finch beaks showing how reproductive isolation helps speed up evolution, explaining that the finches all descended from a single finch species that originated in Ecuador, but developing into new species of finch on each island, with the changes that were selected for having their basis in the environments of the island that they found themselves on, usually specifying food source as the main driving factor. If you want to learn about how we know birds are dinosaurs, that will usually be in a separate chapter of the textbook with all sorts of evidence of its own, and without reference to these finches or any statements at all about how finch evolution is equal to the fossil evidence because they're not even in the same category of evidence. They'll say, oh, we can see finches evolving into finches, therefore we know dinosaurs evolved into finches. Okay, let's apply critical thinking check number three again. Where did that statement come from? What is the source? I would love to investigate it, but I can't because you haven't provided any information about it other than it being from a textbook. And given the level of education you seem to expect from your audience, the textbook could be anywhere from grade one to college level. You're not making it very easy for me to follow your critical thinking advice. But I wasn't supposed to apply critical thinking skills to the things that come from AIG, though, was I? That's why check number one was to check scripture. If ever you guys should fail a check, you can turn back to, but the Bible agrees with what I'm saying, so now you can just ignore the rest of the critical thinking checks because it agrees with check number one. But did he catch what happened there? The definition of evolution switched. You've been having some fun pointing out logical fallacies in this series, so now it's my turn. This one is called the straw man fallacy, where you state your opponent's case in a way that they would not agree with, and then attack your misstatement of their case instead of the case that they are actually making. So yeah, the hypothetical textbook in your hypothetical straw man scenario did use an equivocation fallacy, because that's how you wrote your hypothetical. If you notice a definition switching like that during an argument, you've detected a type of fallacy, a faulty form of reasoning called bait and switch or equivocation. Sure. Now use the word kind without equivocating. And another really common word besides evolution that often gets equivocated is science. As you can learn more about in the links provided, people often use science as a catch-all word when there are really two very important different types of science. Oh god, here comes the historical versus observational thing. I know that's kind of AIG's thing, but it's just so stupid. Science can be classified loosely into nomothetic science and historical sciences, but there isn't some clean line dividing the two. Nomothetic science is just concerned with developing laws or principles. The historical sciences are concerned with events. Nomothetic sciences develop laws or principles using data collected while examining events, and the laws and principles are used to figure out how events happened. Now. I get it, when your worldview requires you to disagree with the vast majority of scientists about the vast majority of the body of scientific knowledge, you need to pick some nits to try and imply that the branches of science dealing with events are not just less reliable than so-called observational science, but are so vastly and utterly unreliable that millions of scientists over more than a century have just been mistaken by their erroneous interpretation. Considering how eager scientists are to criticize each other's work and find problems with it, I find this to be an unrealistic expectation. But even so, the historical sciences are not anywhere near as unreliable as AIG would have you believe. The historical sciences are often based on the nomothetic data. A geologist, for instance, will recreate conditions in the lab to figure out how these conditions would have worked in nature. Think of it this way. The nomothetic sciences simply ask, if these conditions were found in nature, what will happen? Well, the historical sciences say, hey, we found these conditions in nature. Look what happened. 
Of course, this is drastically oversimplified, but we're not supposed to be dealing with the actual claims here, just the critical thinking skills. And by applying some critical thinking, we find that AIG is presenting a very skewed view of how science works in order to get their point across. For instance, while the size and mass and species description of a fossil would be facts from observational science, the assumption that that fossil formed millions of years ago would be an interpretation from historical science. See, this is what I was talking about. We know that the rock layers are old, billions of years old in some cases. How do we know this? Is that through a direct observation or through an interpretation? Well, if we go to radiometric dating, we directly observe the rate at which certain particles decay, and we directly observe the fact that these rates have been constant for as long as we've been able to measure them. We directly observe situations in which these particles can enter or escape from rocks. We directly observe what sort of signs are left behind on the rocks from undergoing these situations, etc. So when we measure the amounts of these particles in rocks collected from nature, we perform calculations based entirely on direct observations and find that these rocks are millions to billions of years old. Where does the line get drawn here? We directly observe the rock in the present. We directly observe all the features of the particles that we use to date it. The only extrapolation into the past is the calculation itself, which is entirely based on direct observation. So technically the calculation could be called an historical science, but it is so caught up in the direct observation part that it's difficult to attribute this to an interpretation based on a worldview. In fact, to call radiometric dates into question, the creationist is left attempting to falsely prevent these direct observations as though they are interpretations. Meanwhile, they are left assuming things for which there is absolutely zero evidence, like that the radiometric decay rates were different in the past. Meanwhile, they ignore the the fact that scientists are perfectly aware of the limitations of these dating methods, and so will usually date the same sample with multiple different methods when possible. And since the decay rates are so different for these different particles, in order to come up with figures that agree with each other, each decay rate would have to have been changed not universally, but specific to each individual rock formation in just such a way as to give agreeing numbers with different decay rates. It is completely unrealistic and runs counter to all all of the evidence. And textbooks often blur the lines between these two types of science. Yeah, because the lines between them are incredibly blurry. For instance, one of my own textbooks said that evolution is as much a scientific fact as the atomic constitution of matter or the revolution of Earth around the sun. Okay, yeah, textbooks do blur the lines, but that statement is not a blurring of those lines. Evolution is not an historical science in the sense that it is an event that happened in the past. It is something that we have observed happening today, and there are several nomothetic sciences around today that confirm evolution as a fact. Physiology, biogeography, paleontology, and genetics all come to mind immediately. Now, the Earth's revolution is something that we can measure with observational science. So are genetics. So watch out for equivocation and always define your terms. Sure. Still waiting on several definitions from creationists, like kind and information. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from The Kraken, who says, I expect the critical thinking checklist has fine print reading, please don't examine this list critically. Whoops. Oh, whoops. Whoopsie. So guess I messed that up. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the critical thinking check number three to the critical thinking check number one that is my channel. If you'd like to completely undermine me, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wish list, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time.